Yama, I'm Rebecca Bateman, a proud Whalewin and Gamilaroi woman and the Assistant Director of Indigenous Engagement in the National Library of Australia. I'm speaking to you today from beautiful Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. I pay my deepest respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and also to the Dorawal people on whose land the event you are about to watch was recorded. I acknowledge the deep and enduring connection of all Indigenous Australians to country and I pay my deepest respects to elders past, present and emerging who are and will be the custodians of this land. I'm very excited and proud that the National Library is able to present the following discussion between young Gamilaroi Dungudi woman Marley Silver and her father Rod. Marley is a writer, podcast host and co-founder of Titters for Titters, a social media based movement dedicated to elevating stories of inspiring Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and girls from across the country. In this discussion, Marley and her dad yarn about their experiences as Aboriginal people. They talk about why it is important that Indigenous stories continue to be told truthfully and honestly, and why we should remember and honour the struggles of our elders. Marley and Rod also talk about why it is important for all Australians to celebrate and be part of maintaining the oldest continuous and surviving culture in the world. On behalf of the National Library, I invite you to enjoy Marley and Rod as they talk about the importance of truth telling and discuss their hopes for a future built on mutual respect and a proper understanding of where we have come from as a nation. I invite you to take this opportunity to, in Marley's words, listen to learn. Yama, my name is Marley Silva and I am joined today by my dad, Rod. How are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> Good. <laughs> it's kind of weird, I guess, in this COVID era, um, we have to be adaptable in um, these sorts of situations. So I'm coming to you from my bedroom um, on Darrell Country, south of Sydney. We've made it into a little makeshift studio to have this conversation today. Um, and before we begin, I just want to pay my respects to the Darawal people um, of this nation who've cared for it and been connected to it for over 60,000 years and extend um, my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, always was, always will be Aboriginal land, which is quite fitting because, um, you know, we are here, even though the NAIDOC week celebrations have been pushed back to November for this year, um, the theme is always was, always will be. And that's what we're here to talk about, I guess, you know, tell a little bit about our stories, um, who we are and our connection to identity. Um, and, and yeah, so I wonder if, if dad, you want to start by introducing yourself, um, talking about where you grew up and, um, yeah, we'll just start there. Okay. So, um, my name's Rod Silva. I'm one of six children. Um, my mother was a French from uh, Maori, Camilleroy country, and my father is a silver from um, Kempsey, Dungadi country. But I grew up on um, Durig, land, Durig land out in Mount Druitt. So I feel I'm connected to all three, um, and all three play, played a big part in my upbringing and um, the sort of man I became. Um, so, yeah. That's a little bit about me. <laughs> <laughs> and so by extension, you know, I obviously identify um, with being uh, both a Gamilaroi and Dungadi girl and um, have really proud connections to, to that country. So dad, I guess a, a good question, a good place to start is, you know, with maybe your first or your earliest memory of, of understanding that your Aboriginal identity, like it's always a hard question because like for me, there was never a point where I found out I was Aboriginal. Like we always knew that we were and we yeah. were raised in a household where that was something to be really proud of. But um, was there a moment when you kind of realised that that kind of maybe set you apart from, from other people? Yeah, just where I, with my upbringing, um, you know, mum and dad were always um, good with telling us who we were and um, what we were about. But it was interacting with, you know, other kids you know, uh, there weren't many Aboriginals at school when I went to school and there were just little things that made me realise I was different uh, besides my skin being brown. But um, just the way people reacted to me and, you know, when kids are little, they don't realise how much they scare you with what they do 
and what they say to you. So it was just little things, not one thing in particular, but you know, people not wanting to sit next to you in class or um, you know, just things that being frowned upon, like just I don't know, going to your mates' houses and um, sometimes you weren't allowed in there because you know, I, I they already had perceived, you know, um, what's it called? Preconceived ideas about Aboriginal people and what we're about, and um, you know, uh, yeah, there was a lot of blatant um, discrimination and racism that I had to deal with, and not only me, but my brothers and sisters. And I think um, it made us resilient. Um, it taught us that we were different. We, so we realised from a young age we were different, and um, I think it made us stronger individuals growing up mm -hmm. and i think that's something that's almost universal for black fellows is that when you are you know we're only three percent of the australian population that means for the most part you know we're the minority in the room and from a young age you it becomes very clear that you are different um to most of your peers and um even though people will be able to see how much lighter my skin is to yours, <laughs> especially in this lighting. Yeah. Um, but that didn't kind of save myself or my sister Keely from similar experiences, but more because we have always been so loud and proud about our identity mm. and, and wanted in a particular way. So it became a thing where, um, you know, not so much as a, as a really young kid in primary school, um, you kind of, it was kind of like, cool to have something different about you and, and kids would kind of talk about it. I always had um, Aboriginal flag coloured bracelets and, and, and things like that and kids were kind of like oh that's cool and that was sort of it but when you get to high school um, again you go back to those um, you know there's those preconceived ideas of, of like what's um, you know who you are when you identify for us it was well you're not really black because you know look at you um, or if you are Aboriginal um, do you believe in the dream time what do witchetty grubs taste like um, you yeah. know just this whole thing and then even other more horrible things like um, expectations that we were poor and suffered for things and um, you know had less of an education or, or things like that. And, um, it's interesting because you grew up in the 70s and 80s and I was at school, you know, um, in the 2000s and we went through similar things, but definitely yours was more yeah, like severe. Yes, definitely different. And um, I think the media played a big part because the average Australian, when I was growing up, thought all black followers were alcoholics or, you know, domestic violence offenders, um, took drugs... Um, didn't work, um, all these preconceived ideas and uh, a lot of the media didn't realise how hard, you know, our grandparents and our parents and our aunties and uncles worked to just get the basic things that everyone else had, mm. you know, so, and even my mates would say, oh, but you just get cheap housing loans mm. and you get this and you get that and you get all this, but they... It's because of what's happened and what they've been taught, but it's not taught that our, you know, our parents couldn't go to school. Mm. You know, um, kids got taken from their families by the police. Mm. So, you know, this hatred of the police is natural for our people because they split up our families mm. because it was government policy. So, there's a lot of things that me as a, you know, Aboriginal man, I wish. My wish is to have a balanced um, story of history and, and have both sides. And then all Australians can choose and, and make a decision about how they, you know, perceive Aboriginal people and how they were treated. Mm. Well, I think that leads in quite nicely to kind of um, the first official question that I have kind of beyond our background and our stories okay. and, and who we are. But, you know... You, you're kind of touching on that now, but what are your hopes and dreams for, you know, the future of Australia? Um, to have that balanced kind of truth-telling and history there, but um, on top of that, you know, what else do you want to see? I, I think I heard the great Neva Paris um, say in an interview that 
you know, a lot of Australians are worried about losing stuff. Mm. Where Neva just put it in so simple when she said, you're not going to lose anything. You're going to gain 60,000 years of our culture, mm. our history. Mm. So that's a, a way I like to think of it. Um, it's a pretty simplistic way, but it's so true mm. in my eyes. Um, I'd like um, our education system to change if, if it, to just give a balanced um, portrayal of what happened. Um, and, you know, with when I went to school, we were taught Captain Cook discovered Australia and basically there was no one here. When we all know that's not true. So I would love our power brokers or our, you know, politicians or whoever can make it happen to change the system so all Australians can benefit from the Aboriginal uh, culture and our history before the white man came and then a balanced uh, approach of what happened when the white man came and everyone can make up their own mind. And there hasn't been much change to the education system again generationally. Never. Because it I hasn't. was taught the same thing. We, well, we were, had to make... Um, unfortunately. Unfortunately, that's sad but true. But I remember the first pro- like the first assignment I remember doing at school, probably in kindergarten or year one, was making a um, a diary of a settler. Like, you had to make one. I remember, like, dyeing the paper with tea bags and yeah. things like that. And it was this whole, like romanticized version of what it was and it was a peaceful interaction and this kind of stuff and it goes back again to that whole truth telling element of that yeah. and and back to the NAIDOC theme always was always will be we've always been here and that's yeah. and you're exactly right and I'm really glad you paid attention to the Q&A episode when I said that <laughs> because I was on it as well yeah, that was awesome but, that was but awesome. that was that's so true you will gain so much and I think that is the fear there's the fear of it being you know power being taken away or yeah. um people losing their self, you know, non-Indigenous people losing themselves in the story of this country, but that's not going to happen. And see, the dialogue from the media and, you know, um, commentators is that we're always getting something. We're always mm-hmm. getting something. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, we're getting it given to us. We're not earning it, you know. Um, the only thing I'd say about that is... It, they never have the balance to say what we gave up or what we missed out on. What we paid in. We paid yeah. in sacrifice and yeah. suffering and they, And, you know, there's no balance. It's either one or the other, you know. Um, it, it, we, we're always being criticised for wanting this and wanting that and, you know, just a lot of stuff is stuff that I believe everyone should have anyway as Australians, mm. but... When it's an Aboriginal take on things, it seems to be dramatised, mm. uh, sensationalised. That's what the media does anyway. But um, if we could just have that balance and, um, you know, I think that would help all Australians to understand the fight mm. of the Aboriginal people. Mm. Mm. Uh, to tw- switch gears a little bit, um, how do you, on an everyday basis, find yourself connecting to culture um i suppose it's hard as a policeman especially in recent times with you know the the black lives uh, matters stuff overseas and then all the similarities with the aboriginal deaths in custody sort of stuff but um i just try to focus on being a good role model for my people and for the cops as well. So I try to do my job at a high level so people can see that um, Aboriginal people are making a difference. Um, And I just want to, in my role as a cop, try and um, save some of the kids that were like me that went through stuff and just to provide a little bit of guidance and support which wasn't around when I was growing up. Mm. Um, we're just going to pause for one second to make sure we're still Yeah. Because I'll be really upset. Sure. I don't know if I'm making sense, am I? No, you are. Yeah. It's hard to put it into words, but, you know, after years it's still of... recording. It's because... I'm oh, sorry. Sorry, it's my fault, but it is recording. So yeah, just um, 
It's hard to put into words your whole life about mm. what you've been through on that. Well, and, and maybe an, another good point to talk about is that, you know, we do a lot of talking about who we are and, you know, um, I guess what we want people to know. And, you know, in, in these recent times, again, you're talking about Black Lives Matter and that sort of stuff. And I personally am, am getting lots of requests from non-Indigenous people to, to give a lot of myself and our family story and you know you want to take those opportunities and you want to run with them because they deserve to be heard and celebrated and things like that but you know it's also pretty exhausting and I wonder if now like seeing the way that certain you know different non-indigenous brands and individuals and people are, are suddenly have all this interest do you feel like we're almost at a point where you know, people can, can do their own educating and, and, you know, that some of the pressure might be taken off us? Like, are we in this turning point? Like, that's what... I, I think we are. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, over my time, I've seen a lot of, like, my grandparents and my aunties and uncles and a lot of powerful uh, individual Aboriginal people um, worn down. Mm. They're worn down from the fight. Mm. They're worn down from you know, having to fight for everything. Mm. So it's great. And I, I think in recent times, you're right, Marley, where you say everyone's jumping on board. I don't know if they're jumping on board, but their eyes are being open mm. to what's been happening. So that that is a good thing for, for not only our people, but for our country. So everyone is starting to realise, um, you know, all the things that did happen and they're getting, like I said earlier, they're getting a more balanced view on um, maybe or understanding of how our people are reacting to stuff that's happened over generations. Mm. One of the next questions is, what does reconciliation mean to you? And I wonder, I think probably a, a better or, or more practical question is, you know, what do you think, well, what would you like more non-Indigenous people to do to better build relationships with us? I, I would like them just to um, do their own research, you know, talk to Aboriginal people, ask them, you know, um, how their upbringing was, um, what sort of hurdles they had to overcome and ask them about racism and discrimination and, um, you know, how they're treated in their daily lives. Um, you know, I'm sure not all our people will say bad things have happened to them, but a lot of our people will say the same thing, you know, that because of the colour of their skin, uh, they've been treated differently, unfortunately. Um, so that comes down to education, I think. Like... Um, I see it in the police all the time, you know, people that we deal with, they, they just don't know, so they assume. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, I like to think most Australians are pretty um, objective. I think most, I think most, most people, are on the fence. Yeah, I think that's most the are objective. Yeah. So yeah. They, they, they can be influenced by one way or yeah. another by their own experiences, experiences yeah. or what they've been taught or what they've heard or what they've witnessed. So there's a lot of things that may shape their opinion, but um, unless you've had interaction with Aboriginal people or been around Aboriginal people, um, I suppose it's like anything, you, you wouldn't know much about them. I think the, on the flip side of that, though, there there's a certain level now, I just think that, the education is so much more at the forefront of our understanding of the, the Australian identity or living on this country that you, I just don't know kind of isn't a good enough excuse. No, not you anymore. You need to take the initiative. Not anymore. There, not there's anymore. so much information. I, you know, the, the prime example of this is what happened to Adam Goods, right? Yeah. And we've had the mirror held up to who we are as a country. And everyone who saw those documentaries or read any of the articles or just it lived through that period yeah. should understand that there there is work to be done and 
I don't know a single person who identifies as an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person, regardless of what colour they are, who hasn't faced some sort of discrimination, oppression, stereotyping, blatant racism, uh, or, or just had to face, you know, a, a uncomfortable situation in a room because people are talking about Aboriginal yeah. culture and you kind of feel your muscles tense up and things like that. I don't know a single one of us who hasn't gone through that stuff. So that tells you that there is so much to be done. But I think you're right in saying that it needs to start with that, you know, baseline education from the day you walk into school yeah. um, that, you know... This is what happened. Exactly. And it's got both sides. And the other thing that makes me hopeful is... When I, you know, when our, my grandparents and my parents and my aunties and uncles were growing up, it was really shunned upon for an Aboriginal to speak out. Mm. When now we have so many young Aboriginal people, great in their areas of whatever they're doing, speaking out mm. and, and holding people to account for things that used to be taboo. No one used to say anything about it because mm. it was just accepted. And we all got tarred with the same brush, but they didn't know anything about us. Mm. So now through different, um, you know, public areas and platforms, our young people are becoming powerful, mm. um, you know, with their message of it's unacceptable to, to, to cop what used to be a regular occurrence. Mm. Um. The last kind of question is, let's say, you know, it, it says here for her, what are your hopes and dreams um, for your children's futures? But I guess I'm getting a bit old for that now. No, but I no. wonder, I wonder really? like, you know, it, what, I don't know, what do you hope, what kind of Australia do you hope your grandkids grow up in? Well, I hope. They grow up in a country that's balanced, shows both sides of history, um, and um, a country where you don't have to worry about the colour of your skin mm. or what you believe in, as long as you, you know, are contributing to the country and um, are being positive and. and being thankful for where you, you are and the beautiful things that it, you know um, this country is all about. Mm. I just want them to appreciate that and just um, remember, remember, never forget all the battles that our elders have gone through to make things better for us and, and the ones that are going to come after us. Mm. And I always think, you know, I heard someone else say somewhere and it's of a similar vein to that Nova quote you said but um you know the fact that we are the oldest continuous surviving culture on earth is something for every single person who lives on, on one of the many countries that make up Australia yeah that's for all of us to be proud of that is such an incredible thing I think we we say it a lot and I think it's it, again goes back quite nicely to the theme of this year but we are it we are the oldest continuous surviving culture that yeah. is phenomenal that is no one else is older than us and and we have survived for so long and i think our knowledges need to be respected and they need to be told and um you know especially when you look at things like the bushfire season and, and just like the way that we demonstrate and perpetuate resilience it, it is unmatched yeah. unmatched and it's just yeah yeah and uh, to learn from our neighbors like how proud they are, you know, the, the Kiwis, you know, they embrace the haka and their national anthem is sung in English and Maori. So why can't we do the same? Mm. Have English and the Aboriginal, and I think we do have those versions, but something that embraces the whole country and something we all agree upon because there's still division, there's still debate about, you know, you know, the 26th of January, is so important to our people because our world was changed forever. Um, but I think there's got to be that mutual respect um, moving forward. So we need 
um, especially our younger people involved in these processes to make it uh, better for everyone. So um, yeah, we don't, we make sure we learn from the bad things that went, went on before us, mm. you know, and, and make sure that never happens again. Mm. Well, thank you, Dad, for taking the time. To <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how it sounded. Down. No, no, but I think that, you know, um, the first step is always that listening, which you mentioned before. And yeah. it's listening to learn, not to respond. And, and we're just two, two blackfellas of, of many thousands, and yeah. we all have different experiences, and there's no one universal way to be an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person. So see this as a starting point. See this as a, a yeah. you know, time to to kind of leapfrog off this into other stories and keep learning and keep reading. You know, we're learning every day as well. You know, that 60,000 years of history yeah. not something we can, all, you know, have all up here as well. So exactly. um, it's, it's a journey. It's exciting. It's something for everyone to be a part of. And, um, yeah, keep, keep celebrating black excellence. That's the foundation of yeah. South Australia. Exactly. <laughs> oh, what I was going to, I was going to say, um, I believe in our people and I, and I'm really hopeful for our young people because they're becoming more powerful. Mm. So. See ya. Bye. Bye.